everybody. Thanks so much for joining. We're going to be talking about the amazing book, Queen's Peril. We are here with E.K. Johnson and Kat Tabor, and I am Shelby. Um, I figure we're going to start and we'll go around and just kind of introduce ourselves and talk about how we are connected to Star Wars. Uh, like I said, my name is Shelby. I voice Princess Leia on Star Wars Forces of Destiny, which is on Disney Plus now. Um, and then I am also some atmosphere voices at Galaxy's Edge, which is at Disney World and Disneyland. It's really cool. <laughs> and I'm a huge Star Wars nerd as well. Um, Kat, how about you? Um, hello, friend and space daughter. Um, <laughs> hello, <laughs> space mom. <laughs> um, I, um, I'm probably, I'm Catherine Tabor. I'm probably best known as being Padme Amidala in Star Wars, The Clone Wars. Very good show. I recommend you check it out. Um, but actually, uh, I've had a lot of roles in the faraway galaxy, starting all the way back with Mission Veo in Knights of the Old Republic, which was my first Star Wars job and my, no, my, yes, my first Star Wars job and my second voiceover audition ever. So wow, it, it boded well for my Star Wars career. And I'm here again, because I have been honored to narrate the second Padme book by E.K. Johnston, our dear Kate. And um, I'm very excited to talk about it with you guys. <laughs> yes. Hello, everyone. I'm E.K. Johnston. Hour. Uh, I wrote Star Wars Queen's Peril, along with Star Wars Queen's Shadow and Star Wars Ahsoka, and a bunch of non-Star Wars books that I can't remember all the titles right now, because I'm looking at the title of other people's books. Um, <laughs> I was basically a Star Wars fan my whole life. So it was tremendously wonderful to write Star Wars in the first place. But Padme Amidala was like my favorite Star Wars character. I was 15 the day, turned 15 the day of Phantom Menace came out. And I was like, it was super nice of Mr. Lucas to make a movie for me specifically. For you. <laughs> it was for uh, your birthday. For me, very specifically, uh, which was pretty great. And it's kind of, uh, I've, I've loved the character and all of the associated characters ever since. And so getting to write for her and her expanded world has just been absolutely tremendous. That's amazing. So how excited were you when you found out you were going to be delving into Padme meeting the handmaidens? Um, I was pretty excited. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, this is, this, in true Star Wars fashion, this story happens wildly out of order. So like wow. back in 2014, I had proposed a book um, called Queen's Hands, uh, which was about the handmaidens. And then um, about eight months later, they were like, hey, do you want to write a book about Ahsoka Tano? And I was like, I do actually want to write a book about Ahsoka Tano. <laughs> um, and then uh, some, some time passed. And I will always remember because I was in Iceland. It was like midnight and my agent called me. And it was daylight because was, it was summer. And he was like, do you want to write another Star Wars book about Padme? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> but for this one, sitting down to actually write a variation of the book I had proposed in the first place was incredible. Just the idea of getting, um, writing them when they were like pros and really good at their jobs and all that kind of stuff was fun. But I am a sucker for getting the team together stories. So it was awesome to write them as new and like trying but making mistakes and sort of putting putting themselves together it was a lot of fun yeah a follow-up question with that is you were saying Padme is one of your favorites what is it about Padme and I guess this is a question for both of you but what is it about Padme that really draws you to this character and that makes her one of your favorites because I agree <laughs> <laughs> I think when I was 15 it was that we were like we were the same age ish and like she was really well, really well dressed and super smart and she had all these great friends and I was like one of those things at that point um and getting to sort of meet this girl who was surrounded by girls which I didn't it didn't happen very often when I was growing up um was fantastic and then as we sort of grew up with the character um I liked the depth that she got and her compassion and even her flaws really are that she's like her, her only her only problem is that she's too nice which is like you know not a bad problem to have although it, it didn't work out too well for her and now that I'm older than she got to be um, I I think I'm the most impressed 
by how no matter what happened or what she, what odds she was up against, she got up every day and made the galaxy a better place. Like she didn't get up every day and try to make the galaxy a better place, which is what I like to think I do. Like she literally got up every day and made the galaxy a better place. And even when it was hard. And I, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Kat, you've been with Padme now for a really long time. Is it, are those similar traits that you really love about her? What is it that connects you to her so much? Yeah, um, it's actually funny. The the last thing um, that, that Kate said, um, you know, my favorite Star Wars quote, or at least one of the top three is still the do or do not, you know, there is no try. And I, and I, and it's funny because I feel like that quote actually applies to Padme. Like she really does. She does, you know, she doesn't sit around and talk about stuff. She really does. Um, but through, throughout all of that, what I liked about her, especially from a female perspective was that she was really strong. She would pick up a blaster if she needed to. She wasn't, you know, she wasn't a damsel in distress, but she also was feminine and beautiful and had really pretty clothes and crowns. Um, <laughs> in true you may have I will use any excuse to wear so, um, <laughs> and and recently actually someone said to me you know if you could describe Padme in one word and that was really cool because after all these years that was the first time I had thought about that but the word that I came up with is one of my favorite words and it was grace um that she just has grace like throughout all of it um even you know even in her death, like she seems to have grace. Although again, I'm still, you know, fighting that she's actually not dead and it was a <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I heard a story once about a guy who got cut in half and he was okay. See, so see, Pat may be. <laughs> I'm just saying there's another Pat may story in there. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, uh, Kat, I'm really interested, and this is also just a personal question with this, uh, what is different about voicing an audiobook versus playing Padme on something like The Clone Wars or doing a video game? Um, audiobooks are, and we talked about this personally recently, That's, yes. <laughs> audiobooks are one of the most daunting things that you could ever do as an actor. And I think it's funny because there's a part of it, like people will say to me like, oh, I kind of want to get into audiobooks. And I'm like, do you? Do you really? Um go sit and read for seven hours and, and you don't get to like rehearse and you don't get to, um, you know, you don't get to do the line over a million times. So uh, I had already done audiobooks, So that part wasn't as daunting for me as it is for other people when it's their very first book. Um, but I love this character so much that it just was so much more pressure. I mean, it, 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 it almost felt like, it, you know, it's partially mine, even though it's not my book, but it felt much more so personal and like, I got to get this right. And I know I've said this before too, but when I first got Queen Shadow, I had no idea what it was going to be. And here's this character that I love so much. And I really didn't know anything about Kate at that point, um, Ashley had said lovely things about her because they had worked together. And I trust Ashley, of course. But um, I didn't know what the book was going to be. And so when I started reading that book and how she treats Padme as a character, and now I know how much she loves her, I, I was bawling because that was the most daunting thing about doing these books was, was this person who was writing this character that I'm like, oh, I know her. And even on Clone Wars, there'd be times I'd be like, no, she wouldn't say that, you know. She's not a pacifist. She wouldn't do that. And Dave was really good about letting me craft stuff. But so I was like, I, I could not have been happier with the way that she was treated um, by EK. And so that made it like, that took all the like heavy weight off and it just became a joy to be like, I get to be Padme for a really long time. <laughs> and in I, case, Carol, you have to be like 14 billion other people. Yes. Oh yeah. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask about, so it kind of leads me into a second question that will go into that is, because, uh, you know, with voiceover and for anybody that's listening, oftentimes we will not get our scripts until we are in that booth. So you don't know what your dialogue is going to be on the day. Were you able to, like, did you receive the book before you started recording or was it kind of like you would get the pages you were doing that day or what was, what was it like? No, thankfully, when you do audiobooks, you do get the book beforehand. Um, because again, once you start, you, you don't, 
get to be like, oh, let me check out the scene and what am I saying and what am I doing? You you really have to do your research up front, um, which in that way, it's it's a little bit more like on camera um, mm -hmm. because once you start going, you just, you have to go. Whereas I feel like sometimes other voiceover, you can take more time with stuff. Um, but yeah, so you get the book beforehand and you do your research and you do whatever prep you do. That's really awesome. And EK, are you a part of the audiobook process at all? Or is that more, it's a separate team sort of a situation? Um, it is a separate team. Sometimes, uh, not so much in Star Wars, but sometimes people will ask um, how names and places are supposed to be pronounced. Uh, Star Wars just does it though, which is why Ashley Eckstein and I both pronounce Rada separately. Uh, which I think is hilarious. Everybody in Star Wars pronounces every planet differently. So it's actually like very, it's very in canon, but like it, it cracks me up to know it. Um, but no, basically um, with, with all of the Star Wars books, and I didn't really, I, I didn't know really anything about them aside from the fact the first time that Ashley X9 was going to edit it. So when it, like, when it started, for those of you who don't know, Star Wars audiobooks are like, full sound and color so like it starts with like a nice John Williams tune you might recognize and like in this case Ashley Eckstein being like Star Wars Ahsoka by E.K. Johnson and I'm sitting in a hotel room in Florida bawling my eyes out because like I had no idea this was coming um Nick who does the audiobooks over at Penguin for us is fantastic he loves Star Wars so much and he really puts so much thought into the audiobook production so it's pretty fantastic to work with him um we every time I see him I'm basically like thanks for that music cue in chapter 21 <laughs> <laughs> I love that so you guys were both making a little joke about how many characters there are uh <laughs> I'd love to hear more about this <laughs> Well, in my I, defense, that, there weren't that many in Queen's Shadow. I was nice in Queen's Shadow. That, that's that's <laughs> why I was so unprepared. I was totally <laughs> unprepared for what was going to happen to me. Um, not only so, there were a lot of characters in Queen's Shadow, um, you know, but a lot of them were handmaidens, so they sound very similar. Um, uh, I did get to do Palpatine um, back in Queen's Shadow, um, which I laugh. I laugh with Nick actually all the time. I'm like, when am I doing the whole Palpatine book? You know. Because obviously, <laughs> I'm, my my impersonation is so on point. Um, but uh, but so yes, in Queen's Peril, there are quite a few more. <laughs> like, there's just about everybody. I was like, who am I not? Um, there are one or two that I'm not, thankfully. But yeah, I was everybody, and there were a couple that were extremely daunting this time, surprisingly. <laughs> I am on board for you voicing a full Palpatine novel. That would be just perfect. <laughs> um, so I'm just curious because the book intersects with Phantom Menace. Was it challenging to write a book that's kind of interwoven with a film that already exists? Was that, did it make certain things easier to find? What was that like? Um, I think for the most part for me, it um, really makes my background in fan fiction handy. <laughs> Um, I learned I learned to write by you know finding cracks and and places in stories where you can expand from another point of view or where you can write what's happening off camera or um, the main difference between films and books is that in books you can get inside someone's head and in film unless it's like Ferris Bueller you don't really get inside their head um, and so that part was really fun for me because I got to kind of go back to Phantom Menace and be like okay what scenes do I wish was in this movie? And then I was like, okay, we can't be quite that self-indulgent. Let's just make it make sense. Um, and then sort of piece things together. And so there, there's a bit of a tone shift between the first half of the book and the second half of the book, because um, I wanted to mark the difference of shifting into the movie's timeline. So one of the things that I always loved about The Phantom Menace were all the like 1999 PowerPoint, like star wipe, side wipe, whatever's for the scene changes. Um, and so I wanted to give the, the scenes in the, in, the, in the back half of the book that sort of, not necessarily choppy, but like a little bit more like separated feeling. And then at the beginning when they're on Naboo and everything's kind of okay, it's a little bit more like flowy. Um, in terms of making things make sense, uh, the only problem I had, the way that I've been describing it lately is it's like if everyone had given me, someone gave me a puzzle from 1999 and like people had been throwing pieces into the puzzle box since 
like for the next 10 years, basically. And then they were like, here's this puzzle, please put it together. P.S. There's no picture on the box. <laughs> and so I had like the visual guides and I watched the movie probably a hundred billion times. Um, I literally like, I was on the fence about whether or not I was going to get Disney plus before or after I finished, because I was like, once, once I start watching the Mandalorian, it's all over. And, um, and then I was like, no, if I get it now, I can watch the Phantom Menace without getting up and it's a business expense. So, um, so I did. And, uh, so it was very, the hardest part for me was the, was the actual battle of Naboo because I don't know what happened on set that day. But uh, there's only two handmaidens in those scenes. Rave and Irte go back and forth between whether or not they're with Sabe and whether or not they're with Padme several times throughout those scenes. <laughs> so I had to come up with a reason for them to do it, oh, wow. um, which was fun. <laughs> I invented a few secret passages. It was it was awesome. Um, but but yes, yeah, so I think that was probably the most fun. And um, the other thing that was a little bit uh, for me a little bit less pressure was in Queen's Shadow, there was mostly self-inflicted, tremendous pressure for her to be wearing something different and amazing in every scene, um, which is really hard. <laughs> and so uh, for Queen's Peril, I got to work with outfits she already had. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to sort of explore their practicalities. And that was really fun because now I know all of the cosplayers. So I have all of their stories of like, sewing and piecing fabric together and trying to find the fabric because most of it, Trisha Bigger, I think, willed into existence. Um, and so it was really fun to sort of have the like actual sort of cosplay point of view, I suppose, as I was talking about her dresses, um, rather than having to design them myself, which it turns out is a lot of work. Yeah, I can imagine. But how cool is that to say that you designed some of <laughs> outfits? Like I what? I think the ones that I designed are like not physically possible. But I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Never tell them the odds. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so when you are recording, Kat, for an audiobook, how long are you in a session for? How many days does a book like Queen's Peril take you to record? So a book like Queen's Peril would typically be scheduled for about four days, um, somewhere between four and five. Um, I have worked with Kevin, the amazing director before, um, and it is a really amazing team and, and they, you know, they send you the pronunciations, but they've already done that work, which is really great. Um, but you typically record for about seven hours a day, like I said, um, and, uh, and, and so really how long it takes day wise has to do with how much you mess up because every time you mess up, you just kind of go back and you start over. So the more you mess up, the more days it takes. It takes some people, you know, also the more that you chat in between takes. <laughs> like totally. if you get off topic and you just start talking, you're like, oh, I guess we should probably work here now. That always um, happens. <laughs> but what was interesting about this book, um, I can say it now because it's out and it's fine. Um, <laughs> this book, we were supposed to record um, and then the quarantine kind of hit and we weren't going into studios. And so I have a home studio, which you see behind me. But I have to tell you, I did not ever want to record a Star Wars book from my home studio. <laughs> it seemed like a lot of pressure because what happens, Shelby, as you know, is that, it, is that normally there's an engineer doing everything. Right. But when I'm recording here, some of it is actually my responsibility. And I had already done another book um, for Penguin Random House, which was which went fine and everything was fine. So I wasn't totally new, but I was like, I don't want to I don't want to record a Star Wars book here and be the responsible party. Like, um, but Kevin, it just thankfully I'd worked with Kevin before and it ended up just being really great and easy. And honestly, once we finished that, I was like, I can do anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, um, I love that. Yeah, but th this one took us about, I think, just a little over three days, again, because we worked well together. And, you know, we we know how we like to take breaks. Some people like long breaks. I'm like, 15 minutes, back. Going, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I, I think we're going to open up to the audience soon, but I have one more question. Um, I heard that there's a scene with a boy band, and I would like to hear more about that. <laughs> so... Basically what happened was throughout the press for Queen's Shadow, 
one of my like standard answers was that if there was anything that anyone had ever made fun of a teenage girl for doing, I put it in the book and I made them like use it for something. So makeup, specifically contouring, fashion, um, like being small, literally anything. And my joke was if I could have sent them to a Backstreet Boys concert, I would have, but I could never figure out how to do it. And then I was on a panel at Celebration last year uh, for Authentic History, uh, which is the fake history of, no, the real history of fake things. So I did the whole thing in character as like a scholar of Naboo. Um, and one of the questions was, you know, was there anything that you found in your research that you couldn't put into the book? And I was like, well, I did at one point come across this like list of um, punishments that had been given out to the guard rotation the night of this like really famous boy band concert in Feed. And from my research, I have been able to determine that <laughs> they snuck out and went to the concert. And then the panel ended and I was like, I need a pen. <laughs> That's so and awesome. So, so I wrote, I wrote it down and then it, it ended up in the book. And so it's probably like, um, my my friend had actually gone to Galaxy's Edge or was reading about a Galaxy's Edge or something like that. And she was like, oh, and like, it would be fun to name Star Wars bands. And I was like, oh yes, would it really be fun to name Star Wars bands? Please name a few Star Wars bands for no particular reason. And she just rhymed off a bunch of them. And one of them was Neurotransmitter Affection, which of course is My Chemical Romance, who's just come back. But it's kind of like My Chemical Romance plus BTS. Uh, and this just like huge spectacle of, of things because teenage girls really love stuff like a lot oh yes <laughs> and and we make fun of them um and we forget that that's why we have the Beatles <laughs> and so one of my favorite things about conventions um is seeing these girls and young women who are so excited about stuff and then eventually they get to be old and older and they're still excited. I was like, yes, we haven't like ruined this in you. You still love things because that passion and that sort of dedication, it's weird to think of it as a dedication, but it is, um, is so applicable. And also you, you meet really cool people. Right. Well, that's something I love about, especially the Star Wars fandom, but fandoms in general, I think it's so, it's a way to keep that excitement that you do have when you're young. It, you never grow out of it. You just keep, and it is a dedication because you keep learning different facts about the characters you love and reading books like yours to learn more backstory about Padme. I think it's, I think it's awesome. And the Padme um, fans honestly are the best. I mean, yeah. it was, it was just like last year in March at the celebration in Chicago, where like one of the best moments for me was just doing a photo op with the, that like um, a lot of the the Padme cosplayers had we had organized to get together and it was just this fast moment in this vast weekend but it was so touching and like the women who love this character um, they're just so awesome they're just the most awesome women and like I don't know it's this weird um, you know like sort of quilt of all these women all over the world who have this thing in common and you meet the greatest people because of it and and they're all so beautiful and talented and they make these costumes and it all like makes me want to cry and that video oh, oh my goodness gosh. yes oh that my goodness video. What's, the video? what's the video okay okay so, we're gonna you're gonna have to okay. link that video well, yeah so there's it's yeah it's it's, in, it's on my igtv but basically this uh some some cosplayers got together and they filmed a Don't Rush Past the Book Challenge, uh, but they did it as Padme cosplay. So they all have copies of Queen's Peril and they're passing it back and forth to each other. But like they're, the, when they do the quick change, they're, they change into their Padme. And the last one <laughs> is amazing. Like, I laugh about it every time I think about it. <laughs> Oh yeah, God. so amazing though. They're they're like they're what the work that they've done on their costumes, the work that they do on their hair and their makeup, and it, it, I mean, it, yeah, we'll have to link it because it is. Yeah, I was bawling, bawling, <laughs> crying like with joy. So. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. Uh, I love that so much. Cosplayers blow my mind. That I, I could never. My Halloween costumes I throw together. I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> it's such an art form. So we have a couple questions from the audience here. Um, let's see. Uh, EK, are you involved in the new Certain Point of View book? Are you even allowed to say if you are? I am allowed to say that I am as of yesterday at like five o'clock. So yes, I am involved 
I'm not allowed to tell you how. Uh, but I am, but I am. Thank you. I'm really That's excited so about it. Um, and it's fun because I, uh, when I saw the contributor list, I lost my mind. Like there were some people on that list I was super excited about. And I've just been kind of torturing myself, wondering what they've written, because I know it's going to be amazing. And I can't wait to find out. So you get the full list of authors on Monday. Uh, the mm -hmm. book comes out on, I'm going to guess November 10th, but I'm not positive. And uh, when we're allowed to tell you what we're writing, we'll tell you. That's so cool. <laughs> I also exciting. love how passionate you are. I mean, I, I haven't met you in person. I'm only getting it through a screen and sometimes it can be filtered through a screen, but I'm like, I can feel how much you love what you do. And that's really inspiring. Um, <laughs> now I'm geeking out. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, did you have a blank slate to work with or were you given guidelines when you were writing the book? Well, I mean, The Phantom Menace is pretty set in stone. So I knew like where I was going. Um, but the weirdest thing for me about Queen's Peril was um, I, with Queen's Shadow and with um, Ahsoka, I knew roughly where the characters were emotionally. Like I knew what came before and I knew what came after. Um, with Queen's Peril, we don't have that same anchor point at the beginning for Padme. Like we know she gets elected queen, but we've never seen any of that. Um, there's a couple mentions of it in the Darth Plagueis novel, but not like a lot in depth. So that was kind of weird of like, how far back are we going to start? And I was like, please don't make me write a 12 year old. Like I could do 14 year olds, but <laughs> please don't make me write like a 10 year old. Like that would be really hard. Um, and it's just, it's just not something I um, have practiced. So the, uh, but it was kind of fun to sort of have the Phantom Menace sort of in my sights as I was going along. Um, one of the things I love about writing for Star Wars is that because it is kind of this big ball of causality, um, like it doesn't really matter which one you read first, for example. However, if you do read Queen's Shadow first, and if you've seen the Phantom Menace, as you're watching Queen's Shadow, you'll be like, oh no, or Queen's Peril rather, you'll be like, oh no, several times. And the worst one, and by which I mean, I'm sorry, um was there was I got about three quarters of the way through the book and I was like I miss typo so much like I just miss writing typo he was so much fun I'm gonna give him a cameo so I did and I'm sorry <laughs> oh that's awesome I guess my my question that kind of jumps off that audience question really quick is do you work with the Lucasfilm story group at all when you are writing this as far as creating a backstory or is that something you are given free reign to um, do sort of so basically I put in the outline of what I wanted to do and then they said yes and then I wrote the book <laughs> and then they were like then they'll make any changes and that's like that's the way that I prefer to work I'd rather do it and then change it rather than ask all the time um so other nice. authors other authors are different um and this didn't happen quite so often with Queen's Shadow or Queen's Peril um actually there was there was there was one character who I had to change in Queen's Peril and that was Darth Maul because I had forgotten while I was writing him that this is like pre-feral Darth Maul like this is angry apprentice Maul not like grand mastermind with the like really ridiculous plan that came so close to somehow almost working <laughs> Um, and so I, cause that's what, that one is way more fun to write. Like everyone's like, I can't believe how much scenery gets chewed in those scenes. And I'm like, because they're amazing. <laughs> it's so much fun. And I kind of forgot that a little bit when I was writing, I got carried away. I got carried away. I had to go back, redial the Darth Maul and do it again. But aside from that, everything. So if you haven't read the book, you will now know that I have to do Darth Maul. <laughs> I cannot wait to hear that. I can't wait for Sam to, I mean, I don't know if Sam's going to read it or not. He is a very big Star Wars fan, so there if, is a possibility that Sam will read it. Um, if we ever do, for your job. If, we ever, if we ever do a panel again, we should have you and Ashley and you both do like your Our Bail Organas and then you both do your Darth Mauls because she had to do those ones too. <laughs> Speaking of voices, this is an audience <laughs> question for you, Kat. Um, when you're doing multiple voices, how hard is it to keep the voices straight in your mind for each line? Or do you record the dialogue separately to keep it in one voice for a while? No. So with audiobook, you go straight through. You don't have that luxury of, of doing that. Um, 
you know, you can go back later if you need to fix something, but you just go through. And so what I do for, for all audiobooks um, is I make a cast, I, I cast it. Um, and I actually do images of the characters. And so typically when I'm doing a book, I'm finding my own version of what I think it looks like or my own actor, like, you know, Kathy Bates is who I have in mind for this character. Um, and I make a sheet of paper and I put it up where I can see it. So with Queen's Peril, what I do is I actually go find the images of the characters from the movies um, online. If they don't exist, I'll sometimes find another actor that I imagine in my head looks like that. And then with The Handmaidens, I'll write little notes um, you know, little personality notes that that EK has provided to for me to remember, like, you know, she's she's more of the seamstress and and she's sort of maternal. Um, and by the time I'm recording, I don't have to look back at it usually, but it does make me feel good to organize it like that so that I can, you know, have that for my changing. But with with the characters in, in Queen's Peril, what was funny is, you know, I know I'm a big Star Wars nerd, too, as everybody knows. Um, so I know almost all of them there was one character we had to look up and we were like is that a real character and, it, and we were like someone Kevin and I were like no and and Justin our engineer was like because we do have an engineer but he's somewhere else um he was like no no I think it is and and it was a real character I can't remember what it was Ooh. right now um it was a ran it was a little random character was it the um, minister of agriculture which one the minister of agriculture no no because that's a real like, character no because I feel no I feel like no, it had an interesting name, like a name that you would think was not real, um, but it was. <laughs> anyway, so like we looked it up and it existed. Um, if you remember, please tell me because I'm curious. I, I have to think of what it is, but the hardest I don't usually get the small minutia stuff. Yeah. Pablo, Pablo probably I mean, and wrote it. I have, like Kevin is so great about taking care of that, which is awesome. But the hardest character to do in this book for me, despite all of the characters, was Obi-Wan. Because James Arnold Taylor is my best friend. <laughs> I'm gonna be like emotionally the hardest. <laughs> I mean, I was like, he's gonna like if this isn't like if it's bad, he's gonna be like, is that what you think I sound like? And, and you know, and so it was so funny that that and Qui Gon was actually really hard too, just because that's a very hard voice for me to do when I sound like yeah. this. Yeah, it's um, very like. And I and you know, it's so funny because they'll they'll probably be someone who's like critical, like she doesn't do a very good Qui Gon. I'm like, really. <laughs> well, like, now I need to hear you say hello there. At the <laughs> I'm well, sorry, I said but... hello there in the in the little narrator video because I had been so I probably worked on Obi Wan more than anything else and probably still didn't pull it off. But yeah, no, I told James I was like I've stolen hello there. Hello there. <laughs> Just a, a, a couple more audience questions here. Um, uh, do you know EK? Are there foreign language editions of either of the Padme books available? Um, I don't think so. I don't think there are yet. The Ahsoka ones have only just started to come out. Um, so I know, um, because it's Disney and then they have to do all of the, it's Disney and not Del Rey basically. And then they do all the foreign press or the foreign edition stuff. Um, that's like literally might as well be written in an alien language. As far as I'm concerned, like I have no idea what's happening. I'm sorry. Um, I, like we don't even have a UK English, like a UK world English version for Queen's Peril yet. So I don't know when the translated editions are coming. However, I do know that the Ahsoka ones have been very popular. Um, and so hopefully they'll be like, oh, people really like these Star Wars books. We should translate them also into insert language here. Um, but it, aside from that, if you, if you can read in English, um, they're they're not impossible to get. I know we're on a bookstore channel and so it's hard to like pitch somebody else, but uh, if you're outside of North America and can't order a book from Mysterious Galaxy, um, it, it is possible, but it's taking forever just because of the, the situation in the world right now and mail and all that kind of stuff. So unfortunately, this is one of those times when we all have to be a little bit patient, which is never fun, but Star Wars fans well, are good at waiting. That's what I always say. They are, about. right? Right? Like my, my dad, my dad came to celebration with me last time and he was like, I can't believe how polite everybody was. They just stood there for hours. I'm like, Star Wars fans are really good at waiting. <laughs> yep. 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 
This is very true. <laughs> I, I love this question. And I think this is our last audience question here. But uh, <laughs> what were some of the other boy band names that didn't make the cut? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Pablo Hidalgo was a very, I just it put band name to come because I couldn't think of what I wanted to call them. Pablo Hidalgo suggested Imagine Varactyls in the first draft. And I was like, I couldn't think of anything else. It was terrible. Every time I tried to come up with a band name, all I could think was Imagine Varactyls. And I was like, Pablo, no, I'm never going to come up with another name. Um, we never. Yeah, which is weird because I love naming bands. Like it's, it's fun, like, but apparently I'm not good at the Star Wars version. Um, so thank goodness to Dot, who said the words neurotransmitter affection at exactly the right moment in my life. And I was like, that sounds like a Star Wars band. Oh my gosh, I love that. Well, is there anything else either of you wanna share about the book or anything else upcoming soon for either of you? Um, no, I think I think right now it's just this book and the the anthology, which I'm super excited about. Yes. Um, I don't know if the mysterious galaxy person is going to come back and tell us how to order books from mysterious galaxy. I can come back as the mysterious okay. voice. <laughs> okay, so the mysterious voice. The mysterious voice from mysterious galaxy will tell you how to not mysterious. <laughs> I'm sorry, I look a lot less cute than everyone. <laughs> less well lit than everyone else, but. <laughs> Um, so EK is amazingly, awesomely going to be doing signed and personalized book plates for these readers out there. So, oops, sorry. So <laughs> if you look above the link, you will see a link that says books can be purchased at and then long link provided and you can click on that. And then in the comment section, you can write how you would like your book personalized to you. But if you Keep in mind that that book plate will have to cross international borders twice. Yes, yes. <laughs> we, are, we are asking so for your love and patience. The love and patience you have for Star Wars and coming out <laughs> is the love and patience we ask for you getting your book plate. But you will get your book plate. It will just... It's coming from a galaxy far, far away. It, it, you know, Thank it's you. I was trying to figure out how to tie that in and could not put <laughs> me and you just... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like puns my brain can't do the puns right now <laughs> but yes um so that is my books and we are now officially at the end of the event so I am going to log off but goodbye everybody thank you, thank so, you guys much so much thank you so much for hosting Shelby and Kat as yes, always thank, thank you guys bye you guys